Hi, I'm LA Wilshaw and welcome to Inside F2. What an absolute pleasure it is to introduce you to my guest today. It is Dam's Formula 2 driver and Williams Academy driver, it's Roy Nisani. Hi guys, hello, LA, how are you? I'm really good, good afternoon Roy, it's lovely to see you again, how are you today? Great, just relaxing after a strong weekend, a very intense one. Absolutely, yeah. Well, the, the season's finally underway and your weekend in Bahrain was eventful with some on-track battles and some mixed results in some of the sessions. So if you can just sort of talk us through a little bit, um, you know, of the, the you were third fastest, you know, in, in, pra in practice on, on Friday and then qualified in 11th and then the sprint race. So just take us through sort of those three sessions, if you can. Of course, yeah. So practice went not bad. Um, we did have a small advantage using the second set of tires, but uh, kind of paid off. In quali, I was important to mention eight thousandths of a second away from a reverse grid pole, which probably would have changed the weekend completely. So you can see how close is F2. We just so we understand eight thousandths of a second means a hundred of a tenth eventually that was uh, our pace for that uh, session and it, it's a bit hard but that's how it is and uh, Saturday was was not bad trying to recover into the points uh, I was able to until at some point we had a small misunderstanding in the radio and I started uh, locking up uh, I had one very big lock up into turn 11 which uh, basically destroy the race having a 50 meter drag the wheel and making it uh, pretty flat at the bottom so a lot of understeer through all the right hand corners and yeah that was basically the end finishing p12 which is respectable but not point no not not a point finish like we always want to see this was our friday and saturday and uh, sunday is a different story yeah, absolutely. Yeah, talk us through Sunday and, and how you managed to get on the on the good side of the top 10. Start itself wasn't very good. Uh, we always try to, to perfect it so much, but it's really hard to predict the grip on the grid, especially with changing compounds all the time and trying to warm them up uh, correctly. So it's a very dynamic uh, thing to, to engineer. In fact, the race went not bad. Uh, the first half pace was was pretty good and I could keep up uh, inside the top 10 or let's say close to the top 10. After the pit stop, we started encountering gearbox issues. So at some point of the race, the gearbox just went to F, uh, which means neutral, basically mid corner. That made one of the Red Bull cars, I think it was Hogger, to uh, catch me and overtake me pretty easily. Nevertheless, I gave a fight. Let's say that is pushing the boundaries. Obviously, there was no penalty, so everything was legal. Not how I would want to drive all the season long. It was very hard. I know I got some criticism about it. Uh, but on the other hand, when I get no penalty and I get the points with an issue like this, losing around 10 kilometers per hour in a straight line, uh, you have to be proud of that result. Yeah, I mean, the, the race stewards weren't shy about giving out penalties this weekend. So, okay. you know, my theory is if, if you were at any kind of fault, then that would obviously have been passed on to you. So in those final laps, you know, there was that four or five car battle, you know, the, the battle commenced, didn't it? Um, and, uh, you know, there was a, a little spin off there um, by Vashore and Fittipaldi was involved. And so how was that from your point of view? Could you see it all going on around behind? Yeah, it's uh, it takes a lot of experience because in many occasions in my past, I was in that mess and losing out of that mess. So in that occasion specifically using the experience and eventually I didn't have anything to do with the contact uh, itself rather with the fight beforehand and um, yeah I understand I mean the spin was probably frustrating for uh, Richard as he unfortunately came to me in the Parc Femme and violently hit my head my helmet punched my head uh, in the Parc Femme um, which he after came with his team manager 
uh, to apologize. And I appreciate it, of course, uh, in the heat of the moment, everything seems very, very harsh. But uh, to his comments, uh, to some of the media, that uh, my license should be taken, uh, I think it's uh, self-reflective of himself, of which license should be taken. Anyway, heat of the moment is heat of the moment, and he's a great driver, and he did a great race on Saturday, deserved that win. So we move on. We... We are drivers, we are athletes, it's how we act. And if we don't have these strong emotions, then uh, what is sport, this action is uh, part of the game. Absolutely, well said. Um, you know, there was, there was a big difference, obviously, between the result on Saturday to Sunday. Um, was there anything different in the setup that you managed to change? So, so you did, you know, get a better result or was it just the way that that race played out and with that safety car, you know, I mean, obviously you were, the, the incident with Rashaw was be before the safety car, that's what in, instigated it, but, um, you know, that second one, but was there anything you changed in the setup? Uh, not too much. I think our car was strong this weekend. We could see Ayumo also doing amazing work it's a fruit of a very, very hard work. So it's not a big surprise. There are small things to still work on and Jeddah will be a completely different story in terms of setup. There, 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 was a, there weren't massive changes, let's say even from Friday morning. Uh, the car is there. It is capable of uh, staying in the points and uh, fight for uh, podiums. Um, is it fair to say that after testing twice in the desert, you know, in Abu Dhabi, then Bahrain, and this first, these first two races being in the same region, once you get back to Europe, um, is it almost back to square one when you're trying to find the balance of the car and, and the setup again? And, you know, for that Barcelona test as well that's coming up? A good question. I think Barcelona is well known for everybody, so it will probably be a similar game. But uh, the interesting thing will be Imola because uh, ride height will play a massive role in, with all those high curves that we're going to bounce around. We'll just have to wait and see. But uh, Barcelona will, give, well, will probably give the same indication as it gave in the past. So yeah, track characteristics will always play the, the, the biggest role in, uh, in the setup choice. But overall of, of this weekend, would you say that the new team owner, Charles Peak would be happy with the weekend's results? Uh, double points, so we can't be too disappointed. Uh, it was amazing to have Charles around and giving his uh, view on, on some of the sporting things and knowing that he has proper experience and he was a title contender in F2, in GP2. So... Uh, you know, it's having a, a boss, a leader that knows what he's talking about and that gives a very strong uh, feeling, very good confidence. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he took over the team just last month. Um, and as you just said, he's, he's no stranger to the single seat championships, including GP2. What kind of benefits does that experience bring to Dams, to the team? I think it's a view of... Uh, as I said, it's, I mean, having a leader in every organization is, is the most important thing you can have. The, the core of the organization, team, uh, company, whatever you, anybody that you, you can call off I mean, requires a strong leader. And uh, we have uh, Mr. Sicard, Francois, who is a, an amazing leader as well. And he really keeps the team together. And... Um, Having Charles now is, is another strong leadership that comes into, into the game, into the family of Dams. And with the experience and the knowledge he has, it's just strength. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you just mentioned your teammate as well, um, Iyomu Iwasa. Hopefully I've said his name right. And, and please look at Iyomu. Yeah. Iyomu Iwasa. Iyomu, yeah. And, um, you know, we've talked about him previously and how he's able to translate the information quickly and apply it, you know, that's given to him. And um, over the weekend, he pulled some pretty stunning overtakes. And as you just said, double points, he grabbed a point in the sprint race. So is he living up to expectations? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And Yuma is a great driver. Um, and uh, we have quite a different style. I tend to say that he's... Uh, more of the young millennial kind of driving style coming, 
the root being like a lot of simulating, a lot of simulators, uh, whereas I'm a little bit more old school, uh, which is <laughs> doesn't feel very young to say, but uh, a bit more old school coming from karting and Formula 4, lots of testing, and this is my base. Uh, neither of which can be called better, but uh, it's a different driving style, and you can see it in the data, in the very minor, uh, you know, in the very high resolution. And it's great because we learn from each other, and our communication is great. So we we are so open to discuss about everything and try to improve each other out of out of good faith, you know, out of uh, good uh, uh, teammate ship. So. I like the I really like the work so far, and it's uh, great having him. Yeah, I think obviously you're the first person that you want to beat is your teammate. But I always feel that when you see teammates maybe warring a little bit, it I don't know if that actually maybe creates a, a negative atmosphere. So to, to sort of not necessarily be best friends, but to certainly have yeah. a good relationship. You know, once Absolutely. you're absolutely in a perfect know. world for me. I would win the championship with him P2 one point behind. That would be... <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Well, you've been with Williams since 2020 as a test driver. And, um, you know, how did it feel for you to get behind the wheel of a Formula One car that very first time? Um, actually, very first time was a couple of years back in uh, 2014 with oh. Sauber. Uh, I got a little taste uh, out of the old V8, I think it was, and it was wonderful. Well, let's say after the first taste of the Williams, it became uh, like a proper role of a test driver with uh, multiple FP1 appearances and uh, proper development part in the, in the simulator and uh, in the FP1s and in some tests, pre-season, post-season. Um, and it was amazing I mean, to be part of the Williams family and the Williams development gave me huge amount of experience, knowledge, even stuff that I could translate to F2. So I think being a driver in F2 with, a, with a such link to F1 that also sort of puts me on the map, but also gives me the right uh, experience, knowledge uh, is, is so valuable that I, I can't see myself the same in F2 without it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it must give you a massive advantage, really, you know, from, from everything that's available to you, even to a psychological advantage as well. Yes. Yeah, let's say the advantage itself cannot be um, quantifiable in, in lifetime, but um, definitely it gives some sort of, uh, of a frame, of a, of a knowledge base, that, uh, yeah, of course, many for the future, for the time I step into the F1, but uh, being able to, let's say, practice it or try and get the philosophy and the ideas translated into F2 is definitely an advantage. Mm. The, the practical um, ad adaptations that you need to make between the F2 and the F1 car, um, which I think you, you did, make, did that over three races, was it in 2020? I mean, how much conscious thought does it take to have to, you know, to adapt between the two regarding breaking points and, you know, even the... Yeah, the you mean in the, days, in the days where I did uh, the, the both categories? Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, we had the three of those or two of those in uh, 2020 and it's just being a robot. So doing the F2 free practice, trying to get my, actually to, to, to find my breaking points and everything, and then jumping into the F1, feeling my head getting out of the place with such strong breaking force and completely different corner speeds and breaking points uh from the thing i just drove but this sort of adaptation is another very valuable training and then of course from the fp1 of formula one jumping back into the f2 for qualifying so it was two times uh, back and forth just psychologically this this training this experience gave me some sort of even psychological belief that oh Look what I'm capable of. And in most of these sessions, these, the, the results were even good. Yeah. 
and, and physically your trainer. He has his work cut out to, you know, make sure that you're fit enough for the F2 and for the F1 car as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. It's very interesting because the physical training is different. In F1, you would train your arms a lot since we don't have power steering. So the steering can be very heavy. Whereas in F1, we do have power steering, but the higher Gs make it very hard for the neck uh, to just stay in place in those high G corners. Um, and yeah, then you just push the both. You just train both very, very hard. Obviously, you can't prioritize one over the other. So there, is always, there will always be some sort of a lack, but uh, we did it. Yeah. We survived. Yeah. I imagine, though, back in those V8 days, the... The, the neck must have took a little bit more of a, a beating up, definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's no secret you're from Israel, from the wonderful country of Israel. So how does it feel to be the first Israeli racing in countries that, that you've only recently developed relations, relations with? And, you know, is it fair to say that people from Israel feel it's quite an honour, really, that you're blazing this trail yeah, well, uh, let's say I came to Bahrain the first time in 2017 with the World CS by Renault. And uh, back then, there were no diplomatic relations between the countries. Nevertheless, Bahrain um, circuit and the surrounders just welcomed us so nicely. And it gave such a great feeling uh, to feel so warmly welcomed. I mean, I remember just seeing having you know some sort of uh, worried thoughts maybe of just un I'm going into the unknown and arriving to such a beautiful country with so great people and uh, I, I mean even the hotel which is next to the track the Sofitel I'm being treated here year after year since then like a king and I just want to come back in every opportunity regardless of motorsport of how much I fell in love with this, with this place eventually it doesn't matter where I'm coming from and what uh, political history there is between the countries. Great people are great people. That's all. It must be such an honor for yourself to be an elite athlete, you know, from, from, from Israel as well and represent your country. Yes, of course, regardless of the country I'm racing in, the support I'm getting from Israeli fans and uh, the awareness I'm raising uh, in Israel of motorsport is is amazing. It's me and Netflix basically, <laughs> us two that's making motorsport uh, rise in Israel. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, forging the way. So when you were starting out as a younger driver, um, how and where did you get your opportunities to, to become a racing driver? You know, where where did you grow up? Basically, was it in Israel? Was it in a, a different country? Did you have casting tracks available to you? Yeah, so did, uh, this indeed formed an obstacle in my career, which I can feel nowadays. Um, the lack of motor, so motorsport was illegal in Israel until uh, 2005, uh, relatively recently. And uh, that means that there, are no, there is no history, there are no roots, and there is no base of motorsport from earlier years that would allow a young driver to rise in an international level. That meant that in third grade, I had to travel uh, to Europe to develop my talent and to start racing, which everybody does at a young age to develop a proper talent. Um, I just had this, this obstacle of the distance and nevertheless, I went, I flew, and I uh, was missing school to drive and to race in uh, local European championships in Hungary, in Italy. Um, it was very hard, and I could feel the distance playing part in the fact that I was not in the pace of the top 10. I, and you could see it by the time on track that guys in Lonato in Italy, the temple of karting, they were living there and they were driving day after day. And me, a young kid from a country no one has ever heard of, coming three days before the race and uh, doing some laps, hoping I'll get my uh, little glory. 
<laughs> and uh, it was very hard, but uh, after surviving karting and starting Formula 4, this disadvantage became smaller and smaller as the travel uh, is starting to be the same for everybody. So then the, the distance of a one-hour flight or a three-hour flight is no longer that uh, important. Obviously, going up the ladder, we see how global the motorsport be, uh, is. So it obviously now doesn't matter anymore, but uh, there is absolutely, let's say, a lack of, uh, of base karting time in the age of uh, five, six, seven for me. Well, let's hope that there's some some you know changes that happen and uh, there could be a bit more of an infrastructure for you know young Israeli go girls and boys that look up to you as their idol and hero that they can perhaps follow in your footsteps. Yeah, absolutely. Now we see young uh, kids starting to form in the um, international karting scene, and uh, karting tracks are being built. We already have a couple of them, so. Uh, there is there is a potential absolutely it feels great it sounds great so your dad did it, he he had a little uh, taste of formula 1 and you know did he how how pivotal was that experience for you and for your career um my i think my father's career was a bit different than what we all know and a bit different than the narrative let's say um as he was not even aware of motorsport until the age of 37, he was just a businessman uh, in uh, Israel and Europe, and he was just becoming aware of Formula One and a very dedicated man with a lot of willpower, deciding that he wants to be a part of it, starting to karting basically at the age of 38, uh, which for all of us would seem like an impossible mission to make it to F1 when you haven't had karting when you were a child uh, and basically making his way uh, which is not the usual career way we know but he read a, a different championships which are smaller than F2, F3 uh, but in fact being a, a winner of these championships so that actually having some sort of a, of a racing talent, uh, being able to make his way to Formula 3000, uh, having some points uh, result a couple of times, and then finding his way through sponsorship deals to become a test driver for Minardi. Uh, it's, it's an, you can look at it in two ways, one of which can be maybe negative, but I would yeah, funny. And another, <laughs> another would be uh, in the light of, look, this is a man who was not aware of motorsport, said he wanted to do something and did it. I mean, if you look at the starting point and what he did, if we would have put him in a go-kart when he was five, probably would have been a very, very interesting uh, career path. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I admire him very much for the way he did. And obviously, uh, it did open some doors for me in motorsport. So yeah. let's make yeah. it a tradition. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a great story. And that, that's why I yeah. asked. You know, it's a, it's a fantastic story and I think that that gives encouragement to to anybody in, in any career that they want to go in that you know it's never too late to to go for your dream basically. So on that note, how what are your career goals? My career goals, well, I like to usually make this goal, break down the goals. And at the moment, it's, of course, focusing on F2 and getting the best result I can. The best result that my, or let's say, realizing 100% of my own potential. Uh, then I see where it gets me and hoping very much it will get me around the top of F2. And from there on, a paved way to to an F1 seat. Absolutely. So one one final nice sort of personal question. So what does Roy Nassani like to do in his spare time? You can do it in third person or first person. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, third person is, is nice. Third person is nice. Roy uh, <laughs> likes to cook very much. Uh, yeah, I, I love culinary. Uh, watch a lot of. Uh, 
professional culinary courses uh, online and I like to experiment in the kitchen and make a lot of uh, sort of, let's say, everything of everything. And um, on the you other do, hand, the most- You do dessert, so you're good at desserts. And the opposite, just a- anything but dessert. Everything that has salt in it, but nothing that has sugar. A real athlete, or at least trying to be. And uh, in the more extreme part, uh, I like water sports, uh, jet ski and uh, kite surfing, uh, which is probably less of a surprise. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm not too shabby at desserts, Roy, so I'll I'll make a dessert. Perfect. Yeah, Yeah, that's that's great. Yeah, we complete each other. (laughs) Wonderful. Well, it's been absolutely amazing to chat with you and to get to know you better really over this weekend. Um, I wish you the very best of luck this season. And thank you for so much for joining me today as well, or you know, on Inside F2. Um, and, and it's been a pleasure and I hope to catch up with you again soon. Likewise. Thank you very much, LA. It's been a real pleasure. You're Thanks. Welcome. You're welcome. And thank you at home for tuning in. And if you can join us on our social media channels by following, liking and subscribing. And there you can keep up with all our Formula 2 news this season.